Hello everybody, and you might have noticed I've upgraded my tech. My webcam finally arrived. I hope it's going to be a bit better, and I probably might even do some editing soon. But today we're going to plan a painting. I just want to go through the process. This applies to uh, illustration, and it applies to paintings you want to do. So let yourself uh, have a good old scribble with the themes you have in mind, try out ideas, and the big thing for this is layout paper. It's a slightly thinner paper uh, than average, and you can just about see through it. Tracing paper will be too transparent. But this is primarily what I learned in art college, was using layout paper, so you can actually build up a, uh, a painting or a drawing uh, from rudimentary ideas, play around with the composition and things like that. So I've got some ideas here. What I'm going to be doing today is The Secret Life of Bees with uh, by Sue Monk Kidd. It's the most recent book I read, and it was very atmospheric about the heat uh, in South Carolina in the early 60s. And so here I just did some thumbnail sketches to try out ideas. There's about four or five different characters in the book, but the main character is a, a young girl of about 14, 15. And uh, she finds uh, a refuge on this bee farm with uh, some wonderful black women. So I tried out ideas. I've got my bee here with a hexagon, which I thought was a bit odd with the two characters. This is her and her friend coming to the woods. But it's primarily about her. And I had some ideas for this. This is the one I think I will go with. And then what I could also do is reverse the image, which is quite nice with that layout paper, which I'll show you in a sec. And then I thought perhaps I should concentrate on the bees, but this looks more like the attack of the killer bees, so that didn't work either. Um, I'll just go through my sources. And the trick is, uh, years ago, illustrators would have reams and reams of reference books. And I don't know if you remember, Jack Vitriano got it in the neck for using one of these reference books for his secret life of, um, no, not secret life of these, for um, the dancing butler, the singing butler. And, um, and he got that from an illustrator source book. But now the days of the internet, everything's out there. But being an old fashioned kind of girl, I have actually used books. Hang on a sec. So um, I've got various sources here. This has been playing around in my mind for several days now. And uh, my several sources are, years ago, um, we went to Glyndebourne. I don't know if anybody was there. This is 2003 sketchbook. And we went to Glyndebourne. And I remember sketching beehives there. So I'm going to use those beehives. I've got it here, a bit more of the structure, but that nice thing of light behind the beehive. So I'm using this sketch. This is why you always keep a sketchbook. Um, and then I also had you some time ago uh, this picture. And I don't know if you can tell, it's, it's backwards. But it's from this book. And if you can have old movie books, the photography in here is fantastic if you want to draw things. So this is Olive Bourne and Fig Leaves. I just remember this lovely hair that she had. So I took a photocopy and then I managed to reverse it and print it out. Uh, so I got uh, her looking like I'm um, in the direction I wanted to, so that makes life easier. So that's the source for my uh, picture of the girl. Um, and then um, this particular painter, uh, Nita Eagle. It's an American book, but how to make a watercolor paint itself. But I remember she gets this fantastic use of light, and that's what I wanted to catch in this picture. So here, you can see that she does these wonderful, uh, very loose watercolors, but yeah, very tight, uh, where she manages to catch light very well. Um, it's a great book about being experimental. So it's How to Make a Watercolor Paint Itself by Nita Eagle. I highly recommend it, and um, it's uh, try out some of the exercises, because she goes very crazy. And then it all comes together. But it's this going crazy I want to try out. And the thing with watercolours is that they're always rather trying, to say the least. Uh, so I've done a colour up and various things like that. Uh, so other sources I have, so I managed to find these are called vector drawings of bees. So you've just got a silhouette of a bee and you can use it in Photoshop, I think. Uh, but I decided against doing bees. But it's, uh, you know, you have to go through these things and that's, and you can just fish around the internet. And I found this lovely watercolour picture of a bee. And I remember Kate Osborne has done lots of lovely bees in watercolour. 
Um, so this was my original idea. And then I just want to show you uh, the, what, uh, this layout paper. I hope you can see. It's slightly transparent. So you can always, you have a good old scribble and then you bring your sketch together. So this was my original scribble. I wanted to get the elements in. Um, there's a very famous pink house in the book as well. So I wanted that in. I wanted to see the scale of it. That's too big. I don't want the bee, it turns out. I thought she was too small, so I can actually go on and scribble around that. So uh, here I was trying out uh, different ideas with the scales of things. So I quite like that, I like that, that scale. And I think that the beehives need to be further down, but we're working on that and having the idea of the sun peeking through these trees in this very hot place. Uh, and also what you can do, I didn't do that, um, so here I was bringing it together, I've got me beehives down, I've got the ideas of the trees, but again, I thought about putting a bee in, but I think it might be like Night of the Killer Bees, really, um, just to show you that you can actually try out quite easily the reverse, and that often gives you a new idea or a new eye on the composition. So again, I think these need to come down. And there's several different ways. So I've got this, this is more or less my finished drawing for the painting on this thinner paper. And how I transferred it onto my actual paper was uh, using a uh, window as a light box. So you put this underneath, you put your watercolour paper on top. Um, I'll have to send a photo to Judy so you can see what uh, uh, how it works. So you put that underneath, you put your watercolour paper on top, you put it against the window and you can see through it and draw it through. Um, if, uh, and I did it on quite thick paper, so it still worked more or less, so you haven't wasted time drawing that. Um, and I did have, oh here we are, trace down as well. This, this is a very good product. I know John uses it a lot. Um, it's just basically carbon paper, you can get a different colours. I've got a grey here. I didn't use that because some, I find the lines sometimes um, stay there. So it's just basically carbon paper. I can show you. Um, I did it. Maybe it's because it's treated paper. But you get this, uh, you can see here, you get this nice line um, and it's uh, pretty much like tracing, um, like carbon paper, but sometimes the line just stays and won't erase. So I didn't use that. I tend to use a window as a light box in preference. So here we are. I managed to transfer my picture on and this is really quite thick paper so that worked very well uh, using the window as a light box. So I've got my um, my main character here, my beehives. I want to have the sun here so I've indicated that and I've got some trees here and I've got the nice house. But with watercolour what's useful to do is a, something called a colour rough. So you just mess around and you don't really care and I just wanted, particularly if you're using experimental techniques, I just wanted to make sure I could do this and how to do it. So the main way of doing this is to keep the whole thing very wet. So I might have to break off and use the hairdryer. It's always a very good watercolourist tool. And um, uh, maybe stop the video, but I am not sure yet. Anyway, so I was trying out ideas, trying out colours, see how things work. I don't like her madly, so I think I might bring her down to be almost a ghostly form. Um, but I enjoy doing that very much. So, um, what I've also done here is to catch uh, some light bits here, and just to save time, I think I would have done it on the original um, pale orange wash, which I'm going to put on now, but just to save time, I put it on here. So I've got masking fluid here and here and around her. I didn't put it on the sun because I want that uh, not to be a complete white shape. I wonder if that was a good idea. But never mind, let's go. So I've got, uh, I've squeezed out my palette of um, tube watercolours, it's only because their intensity is very good, and this is probably the palette I'm using. So I've got Quinacridone Gold, which turns out to be too green, I've got a nice cadmium yellow, this is raw umber, because I don't have any burnt umber, that's burnt sienna, that's sepia, and this is Payne's Grey. In fact, I'll just demonstrate what colours they are for you. Um, it's always useful to know, but good old Payne's Grey, this is actually um, a, uh, what are they, Van Gogh colours, and that's, oh, that's not so blue, and just to have a bit of darkness, this is sepia, which is a lovely brown actually, it's nicer than burnt umber I think, 
It's very cool. And you see how dark it is. And I will tend to use tube watercolours when I'm doing watercolours, just because the colours are punchier and I can't be, I'm not patient enough. So I like to get things done pretty much the first time round. So that's my burnt sienna, which will disappear very fleetingly. Um, here's the Quinacridone Gold, which is a green tinge, but it is a lovely yellow. You can see um, a bit like um, a little bit of green in there or something. Uh, this is the yellow, because this is very primary yellow, so this is a nice yellow. And this is uh, raw sienna, because I'm hoping that, so I'm hoping to make that up. I've also got my um, St. Petersburg um, colours here, if I need a colour, for instance. I'm probably going to use that green and those oranges. Um, so they're there, just waiting for me to use and we will get started. I just want to show you some effects actually while I'm here, if I can remember where I put my sprayer, uh, <clears throat> which is just here. So you can have this nice effect sometimes. And you see when you're on a wet wash, ooh, cool. And I think one of the future lessons I will do is an experimental watercolor day because it's such fun. Yes, look at that, but I don't overdo it. But you can get really nice effects with that, so I'm hoping some of that will come out in the painting. Drink with watercolour is, you never know quite what it's going to do if you're going to be experimental. Um, <clears throat> so just try it out, really. So here we've got the main painting. What I'm going to do is, I think, spray the whole piece of paper. I'm just going to move that. Spray the whole piece of paper with water. And I'm going to go over it with a big brush and a nice sort of golden orangey colour. So that's all sprayed. This is uh, actually 300 gram paper, I think. No, 450 gram paper. Cecil Price uses that. Um, I just happen to have a bit lying around. And I thought it would work, particularly when you're doing a lot of wet and wet painting. So I'm going to try and mix up my orange. I'm taking some from my St. Petersburg. Ooh, yummy. And then I'm just going to add a little bit of yellow to that. Perhaps a little bit of that as well with my big brush. And I'm going to start with the sun. So I want to keep that white. And then I'm just going to go over pretty much the whole thing. So I've got uh, this nice big squirrely thing, and I'm just going to go over the whole thing with water, with a, a, this nice wash that I made. And with watercolour, when you paint like this, um, you have to just go with it. So I'm hoping the um, the water colour will do some weird and wonderful things and then I will just follow behind it as it were. And I'm actually going to paint over the whole thing more or less in this colour. Yeah, I think I made it too wet. I want to have that more or less over the whole painting. And of course, trouble with watercolour is you have to wait for it to dry. I'm going to take it up here as well, so you get that real steamy heat. It was set in, um, as I say, South Carolina in the 60s. And south, um, in the southern states of America, it is just so hot. Um, and before air conditioning, it was just miserable. You had to be really tough to live there. You lie down in the afternoon, I imagine. So I want that um, nice, bright, lighter colour for the sky and I want to probably so what I'm doing here I'm lifting off some of this because I want that to be quite light <clears throat> and then I'm going to go for a slightly smaller brush oh, say that. this is a size 12 and I'm going to pick up more of that orange from my palette and I'm going to try and reference this so I want a nice bunch of orange there and I'm just going in here, Ooh. and you can see as it's wet, you're getting this nice soft edges, and you just have to go with it really. So um, if you're going to be experimental with watercolours, 
you can't be timid. So I want that really orangey thing, that orangey light you get when uh, you've got this really hot sun. I'm going to take that all the way down. I'm going to worry about her in a minute, I think. Let's go all the way down, my little pink house. Um, and, uh, this was a, it's a book that was published uh, in 2003, I think. It's quite an, um, an old book. And it's um, uh, been made into a film with um, Queen Latifah. Now that's a little bit of the quinacridone gold, which is a nice colour. And I'm not worried about smooshes and things. What I might do... In fact, I always have some kitchen towel around your person because this was so wet. I'm going to go in and dab away some of that, I think. And I can re-wet it to make it go shushy again. But it was uh, spreading out slightly too much. I'll say that. Watercolour. Uh, it's a hard master. Um, so I just want to smooth out that sky a bit. And in the world of illustration, uh, because your uh, image is going to be reproduced, you can actually do all sorts of crazy things like um, uh, use gouache, um, you can cut things out, paste things on, strip things away. And I just want some light between the trees here. I particularly like my, my trees from this, so I'm going to take some around there. So I'm just going to go around the sun with my kitchen towel, and I really want to lighten some areas in here. And while everything's still wet, you can have a good old go. Um, in the worst comes the worst, you can use white gouache, which works quite well. So I want these lighter areas here to indicate trees. And uh, then I think I might, thinking on my feet here, make a bit more of the quinacridone. Because it has got this greenish tinge, I'm going to put some here. I'm going to try and keep that house reasonably uh, clean, as it were. I'm just going around here. And there's always ways of moving things around, um, like uh, the Magic Sponge Eraser. I've got a nice little nylon square brush, which actually erases things quite well, too. Uh, and I'm just going to go down here. So having actually done this picture in the rough, <clears throat> I'm actually thinking I'm going to change it a bit. I just want it all to fade away into nothing, really. Anyway, so I'm, I'm letting a lot of the water do the work for me. So now I'm going to switch to a slightly smaller brush. This is a size 8. And I'm going to go in there with the darks. So I'm going to start with this burnt sienna and see what happens, basically. Woo, woo. And while it's still wet, you can do a lot. I think I need a bigger brush. And a little bit of a spray. My brush falling on the floor. And I'm going to pick up a lot of this burnt sienna. This bigger brush, you can deliver more. So I want that idea of these trees doing things. And I'm not right in. And there's some trees here, which I will go in and add more to. Oh, no, right in. So I'm going to just spray this a little bit. I think you had a demonstration from Cecil Rice when he said if it's dry after three hours, you haven't made it wet enough. So I'm not sure to see his point now. I want these lovely warm colours coming in here. And back to my big brush. Got all these colours down here. And I want to. I'm not worrying about detail too much. I want to get this quite free and easy and that can be work and find. Yellow and orange. Yeah. So 
I'm sorry, I'm concentrating, so it's hard to concentrate on um, <clears throat> actually doing a painting and talking about it at the same time. So I'm still going to crack on with the burnt sienna down here, I think. And so now I'm probably going to switch to, I'm going to have a little bit more of that orange in here. I'm just going to dab a little bit off and try and do some branches with the sun behind. Get the feeling of huge heat. And a little bit of orange. And the same thing over here. So I'm just going to wet that a little bit. Just to give that idea of that sun. And the worst comes to the worst, I can always go back to using a magic sponge eraser. Uh, can you see? So you're getting these beautiful effects. Um, and then down here, this is a bit more burnt umber. I mean, burnt sienna. And yeah, a little bit of orange. You can see, so I'm being quite free. Um, and with uh, particularly this watercolour style, you have to let the water tell you what it wants to do, I think. So I'm going to pick up some sepia gel, which is really dark. Whoa! And add some drama. You can see everything is still wet. And it won't interfere with the house because that is dry. So you get this kind of uh, uh, resistance there. However, it's gone down a bit too far, so I'm just going to wipe that away. And not worry about it. So it's quite helpful to do that rough in the first place because that way um, I can figure out what's going to work and what isn't. So back here, ah, that's a bit too much, but never mind. Then go in here, add some darker bits, worry about that in a minute. Little touch of paint spray. Ah. And the problem is, I did it originally with. Um, uh, just my uh, St. Petersburg watercolours, and these are much stronger colours. However, stronger colours is good. And draw them on here. You can tell I'm constrained because I shut up. As usual, the rough is looking better than this one. However, I will persevere, so I'm just going to see if I can find a third number which I like. Let's see what that will do. See, so I'm taking that as a tree shape. So you're getting some really nice shapes in here, but I think this is all slightly too wet. So I think I need to put some more colour on it. So I'm picking up some more sepia. I did originally have her hold something in her hand. She had a very precious possession, but it looked like she was looking at her phone. I mean, you wouldn't have had that 10 years ago, but that particular attitude um, doesn't work so well. Ooh, that's a little dark. Some more dark bits in there. And it's messing around, really. So generally, I do do a colour rough of all the watercolours I'm doing, uh, just to see how the paint works, what colours I want to use. That's really working. So I'm just putting a bit more darkness in here and try and catch a few little branches. They're going to look too peculiar. Oh, never mind. And with watercolour, also, the, the water is always up to something when you're not looking, um, is to, um, you have to keep your eye on it and see how it's coming out, but then not mind when it does do something weird. So I want those shapes up here. I think that's a bit too intense. So a bit more of this. Orange. You can see you can move when while the watercolour is wet, you can do all sorts of things with it. Touch of paint spray there. Ah, that is too much. I'm going to lift some of that off by using a clean, dry brush and have a good old squiggle around. And I'm liking that effect. So the trick is not to fiddle, as I as everybody knows, I would better not fiddle, don't fiddle. Uh, with watercolour, 
So I'm just going to leave it and see what happens. And what also happens with watercolour is it always dries lighter, because obviously this is mostly wet, and it's um, <clears throat> uh, doing its own thing, and it's glossy because there's water in there too. Um, I think I might leave that, I'm not sure. Ah, I see I'm fiddling now. Okay, so I'm just going to take some of the orange and hope that softens a bit. I have a nice shape there, and it's going away. Um, I think I need... Orange. Ah, oh, God, I'm fiddling. Leave it alone. Okay, ooh, that's a nice effect I'm getting there. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to spray this upper corner a little bit. I want, I want to get rid of that hard edge. Ooh, this business will be working. I don't want to do it too much because then it will just soak up that entire corner of paper. So you're getting sort of nice tree shapes in there, and I probably want to bring that together a little bit. Yeah, that's working, but I'm going to lift some of that off with a clean, dry brush, and add a bit more of the chromacridone in yellow. So I'm getting that idea of that really, really hot heat and this rather sad girl. Uh, she ends up happy in the end, spoilers, uh, but it's a bit of a journey for her. <clears throat> and I'm liking that effect, so I'm just going to bring that over. And then in the original, I had a little path, but I might wait for that to dry a bit. And then here, I think I might stick with the quinacridone gold and not the green. So yes, bring it a little bit further forward. And it's blending in nicely because it's still wet. Pardon that one keeps going brown on me. That's the trouble with watercolour, so I'm just going to lift that up again. But we'll be back. Bring that across. And while it's still wet, you can do a lot. So I just want to keep it quite simple at the bottom here. With this nice chromacridone, really yellowy colour. And look, I like the word. I like the word. Uh, so I'm just going to spread that out with more water. And put some grass in front of it. So I'm just going to pick up a tiny bit of this, uh, it's almost like green gold from the paint box. And I just want to have a sort of hint of grass growing up on the leaf And I'm just Going to smooth like right that, so I just want to smooth this out a little bit. I may have to go back in and add some more, but I'm just going to add water to that little bit so it kind of trains away in the bottom of the picture. Now uh, I've got lovely olive critteridge. I'm just going to yeah, get some of this wash away. What I might do, and every watercolourist should have one to hand, is use a hair dryer. Uh, oh, but, please must, um, so here, I didn't want her as vivid as she was in the uh, colour rough I did, and she's looking a bit sloppy. So I'm just going to use um, variations of the burnt sienna, because this was actually uh, the corn make, um, which is this very posh make from America. I don't have any examples here. Um, and I'm finding a bit um, grainy, but this is a good old Winsor and Newton. That's a bit old. Um, there, and I know what that does. So each make of paint is slightly different. Um, and I really, really like my Winsor & Newton and each different make of paint, their, uh, their colours are slightly different too. So find out what you like. 
I'm just finding my reference for her. It's here somewhere. And I just want to start adding colour. I want her to almost disappear into the chromacral bone. So I'm going to use some of that. And you can see um, where I put masking fluid, you can see that it's resisting the, uh, the paint. So I'm just going over here. I can tidy that up later, but I'm going to crack on doing this into my kitchen towel. <coughs> And I'm just going to pick up a tiny, tiny bit of sepia and see what happens. Okay, and that's really good. Enough. So by doing, you find out. So I just want to catch her profile first. Oh, that will be shaded. And maybe go in with some darks here. And this is the burnt sienna again. So I just want to keep it quite pale because I thought she was a bit dark and gloomy there. And just have her uh, uh, sort of appearing out of the white of the paper. Right. I want her to be not back anymore. So I'm going to go on the whole thing with a bit of burnt sienna. And that gold. So I just want to keep it really simple. This is, um, I suppose, the reason I like this image. It reminds me of Art Nouveau, which I always like. All these lovely ladies with their ray long hair. And, and then I just want to have a look at how the shadow is playing on my, uh, my lady. So I'm just going to use her as a reference. And I am going to go quite shushy, I think. So first things first, let's put a nice wash on here. I'm just using my kitchen towel. No, I don't want. She's all disappearing in there. And, uh, I don't know how many people try painting people in watercolors. It's very difficult. But I'm going to give it again. In fact, yes, yeah, so I want the whole thing to be of this misty colour. So that is going to be the lightest tone on her face. Going to be that. And then I'm going to make that disappear. And you're getting some really nice effects there. But unfortunately now this is all wet, you're going to be sitting there watching paint dry with me. There. So to the minimum. So what I can do while she's drying a bit, but you're getting these really nice effects. So I could add a few more colours in here. And this is why I like using tube water colours. Or even the St. Petersburg, they have a bit of heft uh, where you're putting on colours. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to leave that to dry. I think, and go back. When she's dry, then I can pick out some things because there's some interesting things happening here. I'm just looking when she has got a chin. Ah, you can see that's the pre-all pigment going on the paper. She's got a chin. And the neck that's in shadow. It's a bit weird now because I'm doing. Oh hell. Never mind, never mind. Uh, so I'm going to use a clean dry brush, just drying it on my kitchen towel. And I'm going to lift this off. I think this is the trick with trying to take paint people in watercolor. So you have to lift areas off. Hoping the water will do the work for me. So I'm going to leave that alone. So she, I need another fiddle. And then I'm going to go on and do beehives. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my original reference, just for fun of it, and they're painted quite loosely as you can see, so I'm hoping I can emulate that a bit. So I'm going to pick up, um, I'll get some yellow over here, so let's go get the yellow over going. So I really want to get the idea of this hot heat underneath these beehives. Uh, so I think I'm going to give them a little wash of yellow ochre. 
and same here. Yeah, so that's the basic colour of the bee hive. I want it to be because <clears throat> I want this thing to be all sort of this warm, hot heat. Yeah. There we go. So yellow ochre is a slightly different colour, it's not as green as um, the quinacridone gold. Maybe I've got a little blot, but I'm going to leave it because I know if I fiddle with it, it's going to be annoying. Yeah, am I? And I did have here my nice early one, this part. Ah! See, it's annoying! <laughs> Spread it out now, I'm filling now. I just have to continue on. Oh, spit. <laughs> ah, the life of a watercolorist. But, you know, it might be alright in the end. Ah, see, that's the trouble with fiddling. So I'm just going to wet this so it softens. That's not so bad. Right, because it's mostly down. Kate Osmond gave me a great tip. was actually um, when you're worrying about if the watercolour is still wet, you just touch the paper. And if it's still down, the paper is cold. Uh, but I know this is all pretty much still wet. Um, and then I've got my little uh, pink house. Um, I realise it's a bit of pink. So I'm just going to go back. I've got a bit of soup here there. This is um, a little house that's got a wraparound veranda. Um, so, uh, it's supposed to be this fantastically bright, pismal, uh, uh, petrovismal pink. I don't know if anybody knows that pink, but it's obviously in shadow. I thought pink would just jar, I mean, a really bright pink would just jar terribly against that. So, uh, but I'm going to try it again, actually. So I'm going to try just to use a coolish red to make up a pink and see what happens after that. If it's red, so red. And just paint that in, and obviously the pink bit goes down here as well. So that's sort of the start. Ooh, and now my paint because it's wet is mixing in, but triggers not to mind. And then you will have the darkness of the veranda underneath, but that is still wet, so I've got to leave it for the moment. Um, and actually here, I might add a little bit more grass to keep me out of trouble, because I know this is all wet. Again, so I just want these shapes of grass. Oh no, I should put it here. Right, so I'm going to soften that with water. About there in a minute. Um, I'm sorry to say, I'm going to have to get a hairbrush. I have a hairbrush actually. But I'm going to try. Let's try, so I'm putting that a little bit against here. And I'm just going to try and put the, the leaves under this. I'm oh, sorry, this is going to go. Well, that's a bit harsh, so what I'm going to do is a clean dry brush. Uh, so there's my pink, so I'm just going to add a little bit more pink to have it in the trough. It's all the water is quite a little bit. There we are, that's the idea. And then a little bit more paint grey, which is very powerful. Uh, and I'm just going to try and put the veranda in. So I'm going to go back and tweak that later uh, once it's dry. So with watercolour, you do spend a lot of time uh, watching paint dry. So quite a good thing to do is have several watercolours on the go at the same time. So you can go from one to the other. Uh, um, <coughs> and she is. Yeah, she's a little bit cold. And they are yeah, not bad. So I'm going to try and bring my beehives together. Uh, so we want some shadow here. It's a bit harsh because this paint is very powerful. This, as I said, is the Van Gogh. Um, and then there's these different layers, aren't there, in the beehive. And then actually that goes down so tiny bit of sepia. And you can see the paint is still wet. Um, it feels cold to the touch, slightly damp. And you can see while it's slightly damp, the uh, the paint will spread out, which is okay. I don't mind it. 
So I'll just repeat that process for the other ones. Yeah, blue arch, and sepia. So under here. Okay, that there. Ooh, that's a good thing. Transgray, so I'm just going to have a little sepia. No, not even thinking of the sepia. Which is the edge there, and then there's one simply here too. You can see the difference actually. So that is very wet, and this is drying out a little bit. So I'm just going to have a little notch there, and let's do the same for the last one. Let's see how that's feeling about it. Just under the green, I'm just going under there. And then we've got this ledge here. So I'm going to move to that. Let's do it again. I'm just going to soften that again with a clean dry brush. Ooh, that sounds nice. I'm going to catch the edges of this as well. So I want to leave the <clears throat> This little ledge there in the original yellow ochre color. I'm going to darken these areas here just to get that feeling of light. And again, some of this there, and then this ledge here. Catch that feeling of that being a little lighter. Bit of tidying up, I think that needs a little bit more dark. So I'm getting involved in the painting now. Oh, too much. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'm getting the idea of beehives, and now I need to do that to that one too. Um, get this feeling of a little light and rich. Yeah. But they're looking suitably beehive ish. And if you remember, I had masking fluid on, on here, so I will go back and uh, take it off once it has to be dry. So I probably won't take it off until um, Judy publishes the finished picture on the internet <coughs> because I won't have time to let it make sure it dries. Meanwhile, back to her. So here she's all right. Uh, uh, so this is the tricky bit. So I've got uh, my reference photograph here, making her away from her early, and I'm going to try and be subtler than in my original. So I just want to catch probably mainly her eyes. So I'm probably going to use burnt sienna mainly with a bit of sepia and a tiny, tiny bit of paint spray. And where's the sepia going? And get the, a wash of paint spray going on. So I'm going to make up this wash of burnt sienna on my favorite colors. And I'm just going to start thinking about trying to bring her together. So this is the shadow around her eye. It might be helpful if you can see her. You can see what I'm trying to do. So when painting people in water, uh, uh, being able to lift off and being able to paint wet and wet is very useful. So I'm going to use the burnt sienna mainly to be the shadow. There's a little shadow here. And you can see these lines are rather harsh, but what I'm going to go in to do now is soften them with water. And luckily the paint the paper is still slightly damp. So this softening hopefully will work and do it's up into my nose. So I want that one there. So that's softened. And again, her nose is completely disappeared. So again, I'm just lifting off some of this wash with a clean dry brush. And then I want that to be softened. And this. And then she's got this nice chin. 
So I'm just going in pretty much with pure water, catch our cheekbones here. And then I want to soften that. Ooh, now she's looking a bit spooky. And again, I'm, this is the lightest part of her face, so I'm probably going to leave that and soften all that to the skin. Um, <clears throat> and here. So that's the burnt sienna, and that is my main shadow colour. Coming over here. I want her to be kind of mysterious and sad at the same time. Uh, so by illustrating a book or a passage of literature, and I gave, uh, sent off uh, some images of different illustrations through time. Uh, for instance, the pre raphaelites were always at it. They're always illustrating Keats, as far as I can tell, and possibly Tennyson. Uh, thinking of the Lady of Shalott, there were many paintings of uh, Keats's Austin Agnes Eve. So those uh, artists would have been inspired uh, by the poem, being the sloppy rock that they were, and then they you know, got all their relatives together to pose for them and various other things. And was it Lizzie Siddell who was uh, Ophelia? Um, so I'm just going in here trying to catch this. I don't want to go crazy, I want her to be quite subtle. And that can really need softening. And again, I'm going to have to wait for this to dry a bit uh, so I can put on some good darts. But I'm hoping, I just want to soften it out a that we're getting there. I'm just going to use just water here to soften all that. And I suppose watercolour, the main thing is experience to see what it's going to do for you because it, it's a very hard medium to master. But if you allow yourself to play, and I've been putting things up on my uh, Facebook um, uh, Lucy Parker Art School, which has got um, some nice watercolour play exercises, and I have to put some more up now. I've got the tech. It's um, painting flat because um, I like to use a lot of watercolour. Uh, a lot of water with my watercolour, so I want uh, it not to drip. Uh, so I always paint watercolours flat and generally standing up. Standing up means you're that little bit further away from the work and uh, you can judge it and you're not getting very, very, you know, nitpicky about various things. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to have to wait for that a lot of that to dry. Oh, no. Here we go. So I'm just going to experiment. Yeah, this little bit of sepia. You can see this is all quite wet, but actually it might create a nice soft edge. So I'm going to go in there. Um, I'm going to clean up the weak chin. Come on, come on. There's always the magic sponge eraser. And um, uh, there's a nice artist called Jean Haynes. I don't know if anybody's come across her. And she's got this philosophy of painting for the bin. I think is a very good idea and you know she's a very good artist but she does a lot of experimental watercolours where she's dripping and spraying and doing all this stuff and if it doesn't work it doesn't work you can always use the back of a piece of paper and not to get too worried about the finished product because the way you learn is by learning so I just want to catch an indication of her hair I know that she was famous for having this very dark hair. And I just want to soften these lines here. And if they're really the worst comes to the worst, which it clearly does when you're thinking people, you can always use pastels or gouache to correct anything that's gone wrong. So I'm going to try and get her not the sad. Make her eyebrow go up a bit because she's quite sad. And I just want a little bit more darkness just here. And again, what I'm going to do here is just soften that edge. Mm -hmm. and a tiny little bit of wash. And just go down there. And as I say, I quite like my little house. And maybe. It just needs a little bit more darkness in the veranda. So I'm just mixing up a little tiny bit of Payne's Grey. And then how powerful it was. Oops. 
stretch that a little bit, and then I'm going over here. Make that round a little bit darker. Thinking about verandas, I'm going to make the whole thing a little bit darker actually. And maybe indicate some steps and have a little path. I'm just going to leave that for a minute. And I think what I'll do, um, I don't know how much have we done, is stop in a minute, but you can see um, that I'm getting this nice idea. I've actually managed to do something that I wanted to do, which is quite rare for all of us. Um, so I'm just picking up a little bit more sepia. Let me define that hair a little bit more. Not do too much more to it, in fact. I'm going to have a little bit of a fiddle. I will take off the masking fluid. Just want to have that idea of her almost disappearing into this very hot landscape. And I'm fiddling. So I'm going to stop now. I hope this inspires you to look at the work of other illustrators and Think about, um, you don't have to do an illustration, but what is such a useful thing, such a useful skill that um, we, me and Caroline both did illustration at Brighton, is to how to plan a painting. And if you look back at the work of lots of other artists in the world, you will find that they will always plan paintings. You can see endless sketches of them trying out ideas from Leonardo to the present day. And I think David Hockney was saying, was how can you have ideas? How can you be creative if you can't draw? So I think in art colleges, they might think about teaching drawing again. You never know your life. So I'm going to tweak and fiddle with this, which will be very dull for you to watch. But you're getting the idea. And I might post uh, uh, a picture to Judy or I might uh, do another quick video. But I hope that gives you some inspiration and something to do. And do look at my Facebook Lucy Parker Art School for some ideas. If you haven't used watercolours before, uh, my cousin was saying, I need to use watercolours. So I did a little demonstration <clears throat> of how to use watercolours for her. And I think I might do another one now I've got new tech. Okay, thank you and see you next week. <laughs>